Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to talk about the classification of matter. And there are two main ways by which matter is classified, and those are according to composition and according to state. So let's first talk about classifying matter in terms of composition. So matter is defined as anything that takes up space and has mass. So the chair that you're sitting on right now, or the computer that you're watching this video on right now, or even the air that you're breathing in right now, all of these things take up space and they all have mass and they're therefore considered to be matter. Now within matter we have two main subdivisions. We have pure substances and we have mixtures. And what differentiates pure substances from mixtures is that the composition of a mixture can vary from one sample to another uh, while the same cannot be said for pure substances. So uh, in other words if I had two samples of pure water uh, those two samples are going to have the same exact composition. Therefore, water is considered to be a pure substance. Uh, on, on the other hand, if I had two uh, samples of, let's say, Kool-Aid, well, there's lots of things that can make uh, the composition of one sample of Kool-Aid differ from that of another sample. So, for instance, uh, what's the flavor of the Kool-Aid? Is it grape Kool-Aid? Is, uh, is it tropical punch? Is it peach mango, which is my favorite? Also, how much of that Kool-Aid powder is dissolved uh, in the water? You know, how, how concentrated is the mixture? So, it's for this reason that Kool-Aid is considered to be a mixture. So within pure substances we have elements and we have compounds and then within mixtures we have homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. So let's talk about pure substances a little more uh, starting with elements. So an element is a substance which cannot be broken down uh, cannot be chemically broken down into simpler substances and I stress the word chemically here uh, because if you further your chemistry education, uh, eventually uh, you will uh, reach a topic called nuclear chemistry. And in studying nuclear chemistry, you'll find that elements actually can be broken down into simpler substances. However, this is not by chemical means. This is by nuclear reactions. So there's a very fine distinction between chemical reactions and nuclear reactions. And one example of, uh, of an element would be gold. Uh, gold cannot be chemically broken down into anything simpler. And then we have compounds, and a compound is two or more elements combined into a fixed ratio. So a good example of a compound is water. Water is composed of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, and they are combined into a two to one ratio, respectively. So let's move on to mixtures. Uh, like, as I said before, we have homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures, and in a homogeneous mixture, uh, the composition is the same throughout. So I'm going to return to my old example here of Kool-Aid. If you were to take a glass of Kool-Aid and analyze two separate parts of it, you would find that those two parts have identical compositions. Therefore, uh, Kool-Aid is considered to be a homogeneous mixture. And then we have heterogeneous mixtures. In a heterogeneous mixture, the composition of one region of the sample actually differs from another. So uh, a good example of a heterogeneous mixture would be trail mix. Uh, if I were to look at one part of a, trail, uh, of a sample of trail mix, I might see uh, M&Ms and uh, peanuts, and if I were to look at another part, I might see almonds and raisins. So trail mix is therefore a heterogeneous mixture. So that pretty much does it for classifying uh, matter in terms of composition. Now let's talk about classifying matter in terms of state. So there are three states of matter that I'm going to talk about in this video, and those are solid, liquid, and gas. There's also a fourth state called plasma, but I'm not really going to go over it in this video. I'll leave it to you to do that. So let's start with solid matter. So in solid matter, the atoms or molecules that compose the matter are very close uh, together and they're also sort of locked into place. Now they do move a little bit. They can vi they, they, they do vibrate, but they don't really, the atoms or molecules, they don't really move around each other and they don't really uh, move past one another. And it is for this reason that uh, solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. Now let's talk about liquid matter. So in liquid matter, the atoms or molecules uh, that compose the matter, they're, they're still very close together. They're about as close together as they are in solid matter, but they're not bound by the, the same constraints that they would be if they were solid matter. They are free to move around, and they are free to move past one another. And it is for this reason uh, that liquids have a definite volume, but they have an indefinite shape. So they, they, uh, they will take the shape of whatever container that they're in. So the last state of matter that I'm going to talk about is gas. And in a sample of gas, the atoms or molecules are very uh, far apart from one another to the point where gases are actually compressible, meaning that they can be forced to occupy a smaller volume. So when you sit on an air mattress, what you're doing is you're compressing 
the air in that air mattress, you're compressing that gas, you're forcing it into a smaller volume. So gases not only have an indefinite shape like liquids, but they also have an indefinite volume as well. They will take the shape and volume of their containers. So there's a lot of terms associated with the changes uh, that occur between uh, going from one state of matter to another. Uh, and some of them you might be familiar with, some of them you might not be as familiar with, but we're going to go over all of them right now. So uh, from solid to liquid, we call that melting. If you're going from liquid down to a solid, we call that freezing. You're probably familiar with these two already. Uh, if you're going from a liquid to a gas, we call that vaporization. And if you go from a gas to a liquid, we call that condensation. Uh, it's also possible uh, to go directly from a solid to a gas without passing through the liquid state, and we call that sublimation. So a good example would be dry ice. If you, uh, you know, get a block of dry ice and you're at, uh, you're at you know, room temperature and atmospheric pressure, uh, that dry ice is going to go straight from solid carbon dioxide to gaseous carbon dioxide without passing through the liquid state. And then finally, uh, going from gas back down to solid, that's called deposition. So there's all of that uh, terminology for you. Now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about physical and chemical changes. So what a physical change is, is a physical change, in, in a physical change, the appearance or the state of matter is altered. So a good example of these, uh, of a physical change would be uh, scissors uh, cutting paper. You're, you're splitting the paper in half, but you're not really altering the chemical composition of the paper. Uh, also, uh, other examples of, of uh, physical changes are pretty much, or exactly, uh, every change that uh, I went over in the, in the aforementioned slide. So this slide here, all of these changes are physical changes. Uh, and then we have chemical changes. So in a chemical, uh, in a chemical change, the composition of the matter is actually altered. Substances are transformed into new substances. So uh, in this picture here, we see a rusty nail. So the, uh, the process of rusting is a chemical change. What will happen is um, the metal, so let's just uh, say that, uh, I don't really know what metal this nail is made of, but let's just say it's iron, for instance. Uh, in, in the process of rusting, the iron will combine with the oxygen that's in the air to form a new substance called iron oxide, iron two oxide. And um, so when that happens, you know, it's no longer iron and it's no longer the oxygen in the air, it is now a new substance called iron oxide. So there, therefore it's considered to be a chemical change. So to wrap things up a little bit, I'd like to go just, uh, just, just go through a, a couple of examples and we'll see if we can't figure out whether or not they are uh, physical or chemical changes. So how about wood burning? Is that a physical change or a chemical change? What do you think? I think it is a chemical change, right? Because the, uh, the composition of the wood is actually changing. It's burning, it's becoming uh, brand new substances. Uh, let's talk about, uh, how about water boiling? Is that a physical change or a chemical change? Well, boiling is actually a type of vaporization. Remember, vaporization is actually the, uh, the, um, the change from the liquid to the gas phase, so water boiling is actually a physical change. How about dry ice subliming? I actually mentioned this <laughs> uh, a few moments ago, and uh, if you were uh, listening during that part of the video, then you have probably figured out that dry ice subliming is actually a physical change. You're going from the uh, solid state to the gas state, but you're not really changing. It's, it's carbon dioxide no matter what. It's, you're, uh, you're going from solid carbon dioxide to gaseous carbon dioxide, so this is a physical change. How about hydrofluoric acid eating glass? So hydrofluoric acid is a very corrosive uh, acid, so much that it'll, it'll actually chew through glass. So some of these examples, they might require a little bit of uh, background knowledge, but uh, when hydrofluoric acid eats glass, this is actually a chemical change. New substances are being formed. So this is a chemical change. So, you know, that, that might require a little bit of background knowledge, but Nevertheless, uh, now you, uh, you can at least say that you learned something today. How about the decaffeinating of coffee? Is that physical or is that chemical? Well, if you're decaffeinating coffee, all you're doing is you're just separating the caffeine from the rest of the coffee and the chemical compositions of all the substances are still intact, so this is actually a physical change.
And I think I have one, either one or two more examples here. How about, yeah, one more example. How about sugar dissolving in water? Is this a physical change or a chemical change? And this one is kind of tricky because when you dissolve sugar in water, it looks like the sugar completely disappeared, but what you're really doing is you're taking each of the sugar molecules and you're surrounding it by water molecules. So you're not really breaking apart the sugar molecules. What you're doing is you're just taking each of them and surrounding them all uh, by water molecules. You are making them aqueous, so to speak. So sugar dissolving in water is therefore a physical change as well. All right, so that just about wraps it up for this video, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next one.